Hi, everyone. This is a reading of Roger R. Smith. Alberta has a sovereign right to issue uh, its and use its own credit. It was written in 1937, and it was presented to uh, uh, Premier Eberhardt in 1935. So uh, I found this interesting, so I should send it out along with uh, uh, our push for uh, Western separation and the formation of the Canadian Economic Union. So let's uh, jump into it. You can find this online. There's uh, going to be a link below. Uh, Alberta has a sovereign right to issue and use its own cred uh, credit. A factual examination of the constitutional problem by R. Roger Smith, Ottawa, 1937. Note, the information contained in this booklet has been placed before Premier Eberhardt and its members of Cabinet by R. Roger Smith at the McDonald Hotel, Edmonton, in October 1935. Forward. Although the information in this booklet is important to all provinces and all Canadians, it is vital to the people of Alberta, particularly the elected members, because Alberta elected representatives committed to, the, to introduce a social credit regime. Throughout the country, Canadians are intently watching Alberta. Why do they stall? Why do they not put a social credit into effect? They talked about it enough, and it is that they do not know the relationship of Alberta to the Dominion. These are questions being asked today. By checking the information in this brochure, it can be proved that Alberta has a sovereign right to issue its, and use its own credit. If, however, the members do not do this, they can be justly accused by their electors of incompetence or worse. The facts are taken from the statutes at large, from the archives, and from the original historical sources, which are irrefutable. I desire to express my gratitude to the various constitutional authorities who have assisted me in checking and verifying the facts contained herein. RRS. Page 2. I attempt to federate the colonies of the British North America. The reason the request of the colonies to be permitted it to the form a federal union was refused, refused by the Colonial Office in 1867 uh, was because the United States was pressing Great Britain for a settlement of claims for indemnity arising out of the actions of the British naval, Navy during the Civil War, for which Great Britain acknowledged responsibility in the Treaty of Washington. The terms of this treaty could only be settled by retaining Canada, Canada as a colony. Great Britain had not only assisted to Confederacy from 1861 to 1865, but had joined in conspiracy with uh, France and Spain and Austria to divide North America between them. On October 31st, 1861, in the convention that was held in London, attended by delegates from England, Spain, and France, they agreed to a joint intervention in Mexican affairs. Emperor Maximilian, brother of Franz Joseph of Austria, was to be placed at the throne of Mexico, Louisiana, which extended at the time from the Gulf of Mexico to the Canadian border, was to be returned to France. The northern states were to be defeated and returned to England as colonies. The Confederacy was to be free and retain their slaves. Then Great Britain floated the bonds of the Confederacy. The proceeds were used to build the Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and the Shenandoah fast sailing ships and their auxiliaries. These were built in Great Britain, and the headquarters of the Confederate Navy was in Liverpool as all Confederate ports were blockaded. They sank $15 million worth of United States shipping without taking a prize into the Admiralty Court and without firing a shot at the armed enemy. Great Britain also spent $5 million on her own navy and at the time of the Trent Affair embarked 8,000 troops for Canada to attack Lincoln from Toronto. The Spanish fleet at the time in Cuban waters arrived to invest in Veracruz December 14, 1861, and British and French fleets arrived January 6 and January 7, 1862. France supplied 30,000 troops for this campaign. The Tsar of Russia takes a hand. Still smarting from the Crimean War from 1854 to 1856, the Tsar, to disrupt the scheme of the European allies, sent his powerful uh, Baltic squadron to New York Harbor and his 
uh, Pacific Squadron to San Francisco. His action had the desired effect. Great Britain and Spain withdrew their fleets from Veracruz, leaving the burden of supporting Emperor Maximilian entirely to France. He was eventually taken prisoner and, with two of his generals, court-martialed and shot. When Lincoln won the Civil War, uh, France was informed, in plain terms, that the United States would not tolerate a French force or the existence of any foreign monarchy in Mexico. On January 14, 1866, Napoleon ordered his general in Mexico to withdraw his troops. Page 3. Speech in Ottawa at session of 1865 by the Honorable John A. MacDonald on terms of Treaty of Washington. In a four-and-a-half-hour speech in Ottawa, the Honorable John A. MacDonald told the House that he was notified by statesmen in the United States that if satisfactory terms could not be agreed upon, it meant war between the United States and Great Britain. In that event, naturally, Canada would be invaded. During these events and hectic times, our delegates arranged to leave Canada July 30, 1866, to take the Quebec resolutions to London. These resolutions, which were for a federal union, were to be returned to the people uh, to, or their ratification, uh, were to have a government of the Canadian people. Tilly, Tupper, Archibald, and the Maritime delegates left and arranged Tilly to be chairman. The John A. Macdonald wrote him on the eve of his departure. On no account change any of the provisions of the resolution for if you do not if you do it, it may mean an entire reopening of the negotiations with the provinces and the consequent disruption of our plans the honorable john wrote the letter because he was unavoidably detained armed parties of men from the united states had invaded ontario citizens were enlisted to repeal the raids they were not driven out however until uh, looks like eight million dollars of damages was done to the province of Ontario. The United States was, were pressing for a settlement of the claims against Great Britain and an official, unofficial agreement had been reached on the terms of the Treaty of Washington before the Honorable John could leave Canada, which he did later in the latter part of November. Our delegates in London had been unsuccessful in their attempt to bring the Quebec resolutions to the attention of Parliament and were cooling their heels in London waiting for him. On arrival, he immediately convened with the delegates in Westminster Palace Hotel, December 4th, 1866, but there, where they sat until December 24th, drafting the Kingdom of Canada draft of the bill. Each delegate signed a separate copy. These are carefully preserved in the archives in Ottawa. A draft was sent to uh, Lord Carnav Carnarvon, Secretary of the State of the Colonies, by Honor Honorable John, December 26, 1866. He had a reply dated the 28th, stated that the draft which was being sent to the printers to be printed. This draft of the bill, which came, contains the following repealing clause, was rejected by the Colonial Office. From after... From and after the Union, all acts uh, and parts of acts passed by the Parliament of Great Britain, the Parliament of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and the Legislature of Upper Canada, and the Legislature of Lower Canada, and the Legislatures of Nova Scotia, or the Legislature of New Brunswick, which are repugnant to or inconsistent with the provisions of this act, shall be and the same are hereby repealed. It is not difficult to understand why the Colonial Office objected to Canada's request for self-government. It would have been a uh, indistinguishable word on the part of Great Britain to, uh, again, undistinguishable, the provinces created a federal union. It was imperative for the best interest of Great Britain and Canada retain, to be retained as a colony so that they could settle the terms they have tentatively agreed on to in the Treaty of Washington. In a pamphlet 
entitled The Balance Sheet of the Washington Treaty, 1871, a copy of which is in the Parliamentary Office of Ottawa. Viscount Bury, the author and a member of the Imperial Parliament, frankly tells us the interests of Canada are sacrificed to make peace between England and the United States. Agreed to pay $3.5 million in settlement for the claims of the shipping sunk, the Alabama claims, the national expression of regret and apology, Canadian loan $2.5 million, settled claims arising out of the war, to secession of to territorial rights and uh, perpetuity, uh, to secession of perpetuity, of joint nav- uh, navigation of the St. Lawrence to secession of indemnity for the Fenian raids, $8 million, uh, to equal rights with British subjects of fishing rights in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. An arbitration board was set up and the final payment made by Great Britain at Geneva by payment of 3,229,000 pounds in 18 18- 72. The United States allowed certain sons for the distributed boundaries, which should have been credited or paid by Great Britain to Canada, as well as an indemnity for the Fenian raids of $8 million, which is still owing to the province of Ontario. The Colonial Office granted our request for federal union, the Imperial Parliament, which would would have had nothing to barter with their settlement with the United States, as well as the possibility that after creating a federal union, Canada would join with the United States, which at the time was considered an enemy. The status of Canada has since been changed by an act of the Imperial Parliament, the Statue of Westminster in December 11, 1931, Section 11, of the Acts states that Canada is no longer considered to be a colony and recognizes Canada as an equal with Great Britain and as a member of the British Commonwealth of Nations. Point two, how did we get the BNA Act of 1867? In a communication dated 18, uh, December 28, 1866, Lord Caravan Carnarvon uh, acknowledged receipt of the draft of the bill submitted by the Honorable John A. Macdonald, Chairman of the Canadian Delegates, and told him that he was sending the draft to the printers to be printed. This draft, this was done as we have in the archives of Ottawa printed copies of the draft. Each delegate from Canada signed his own copy. The British North American Act passed in the second reading of the House of Commons without being printed. See. Uh, Hansard, February 26, 1867. Between December 28th and February 9th following, we are informed by Sir Frederick Rogers, Undersecretary of the State of the Colonies. They held, page 5, many meetings at which I was always present. Oh, goodness. Uh, I was always present. Lord Carnarvon was in the chair, and I was rather disappointed in his power of presidency. I had always believed, and the belief was so consolidated itself that I can hardly realize the possibilities of anyone thinking the contrary, that the, uh, the destiny of our colonies it's, is independence, and that in, he, in this view, the function of the col- colonial office is to secure that our connection, while it lasts, shall be profitable to both parties and, and our separation when it comes to the, uh, when it comes as amicably as possible. This option was founded first on the general pr- principle that a spirited nation and a colony becomes a nation will not submit to be governed in its internal affairs by distant government and that nations geographically remote have no such common interest that will bind them permanently together in a foreign policy with all of its details and munitions. In the midst of the meeting at which the British North American Act was drafted have never been made public. Referred to Hassard, we find that the bill uh, was introduced by Lord Carnarvon to the House of the Lords on February 9, 1867, and in the following words, the bill opens by reciting the desire of the several provinces to be federally united. Uh, 
The actual words of the preamble are, by reason of the request of the colonies for the federal government, it is uh, expedient, therefore, that they have laws and regulations to guide them. Lord Campbell, leader of the opposi- uh, sorry, opposition in the House of Lords, in opening his speech at the second reading of the bill, February 22nd, 1867, says, the bill is founded, I believe, on what is termed the Quebec scheme of 1864. Our lights may uh, indeed may be imperfect upon this part of the subject, and I will not dwell upon it. But one thing is clear in the preamble of the resolution comes before us in the clear and perfect authenticity. There is no reason to doubt that the House of Lords believed they were enacting a measure that would permit the provinces to form a federal union. The page which sets forth the uh, enunciation of the motives for the measure uh, and enacted is not part of the printed copies of the Act received in Canada. Instead of this, we have a substitution, whereas the provinces of Canada, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, have expressed their desire to be federally united into one dominion. This is not a true statement and is discussed under the heading What is the BNA Act? Let us now hear what the Privy Council has to say. Chairman of the Privy Council Maritime Bank Case 1892, uh, AC 441, recognizes the object or redes entre of the measure as it was stated in the preamble as most important. The object of the Act was to create a federal union, trusted with the exclusive administration of affairs in which they, if they had a common interest, each province retaining its own independence and, if autonomy, the object of the Act supersedes in importance any subsequent section. Why was this page, which contains uh, this deleted from the printed copies circulated in Canada, It was to twist the measure so that Canada should be retained as a colony. British North America Act, enacted, bill enacted 1867. After passing the House of Lords, it was taken to the Commons, February 26, 1867. The date uh, there centered uh, around the appropriation to the intercolonial railway. The purpose of the Act was not discussed. It was evident. It evidently was assumed that this had been debated in the Lords. One member asked the government, why all the haste in enacting the measure? I am not sure I will have anything against it, but it affects 4 million people, and we should have an opportunity to study the measure, which is now in the second reading, and it has not been printed. After passing the Commons, it received the assent of, the, of Queen Victoria, March 29, 1867, to become effective in Canada, July 1, 1867. Strenuous opposition was expressed by Nova Scotia. A protest against the Act was signed by 30,000 people, and in the election of May Dr. Tupper's government was defeated in the House of 36 members. Uh, Stuart Campbell of Guysborough County and Dr. Tupper were, were the only two returned. Tupper resigned. Joseph Howe and eight members were delegated to place a petition before the Imperial Parliament that Nova Scotia be uh, relieved of this measure or a Royal Commission of Inquiry be appointed. Dr. Tupper, along lifelong political enemy of Howe followed him to London and going to his hotel said, nothing that I can say will deter you from placing your petition before Parliament, but they will not grant your request. When they refuse, come back to Canada and take a cabinet seat in Ottawa, and we will do the best we can do with what we've got. Howe was dumbfounded, for he had previously I had thought that Tupper, who was one of the delegates to London dealing with the Quebec resolutions, was partly responsible for drafting the British North American Act. He introduced John Bright to place the petition before Parliament. It was, as Dr. Tupper, um, words not clear, defeated the vote herein. And then a bunch of other words not clear. In a speech... Uh, on leaving London, Howe said, we 
go home, to share the perils of our native land in whose service we consider it an honor to labor and whose fortunes in the darkest hour of our history it would be cowardice to desert. Let's take a pause. Second part of reading. Uh, what is the British North American Act? The British North American Act is not and has never been legal and valid as the Constitution of Canada. Canada has no constitution. The Act is a private bill conceived and drafted by the original office uh, and act, enacted into statute by the Imperial Parliament. United four colonies of North America into one colony. Last year, 1936, the Imperial Parliament enacted a bill amending the constitution of the island of Malta, a colony in the Mediterranean. Students of law recognize this act as a private bill in relation to the empire as it affected only Malta. The British North America Act is placed in the same category as it affects only Canada. A private bill must always have a preamble, the uh, recitals of which must be proved. This is a substan uh, substantive uh, enunciation of the motives which impelled the Parliament to enact the statute. It is most important part of the Act superseding in any in importance any of the subsequent sections. The Act must be read and construed as a whole, although one section may bear a wider uh, and another a more limited meaning. The Government General is the government with power to appoint a council to aid and advise him, or he can remove them from office at his discretion. The custody of the great seal is granted to him the power to appoint judges, justice of the peace, commissioners, deputies of himself, lieutenant governors of the province, and members of the tenant. He can remove any person from office exercising any official power in our dominion, including the Premier of Canada and the Speaker of the Senate. In so far as the provinces are conceived, he takes the place of the Queen and the Secretary of State. In other words, any legislation of the legislatures of the provinces can be disallowed by him. Further, the provinces cannot refer any legislation so disallowed to the Imperial Parliament or the Crown. There was no confederation. There is nothing in the historical record that can be recited can be cited to support the story of confederation. There is nothing in the act to alter in any essential respect the colonial relationship or to weaken the crown's headship, nor is there anything in the act to indicate the, the surrender in any degree of the fundamental principles of the British government, the full legislative and executive power to govern over and throughout the British Empire. An examination of the historical record shows that fraud was recorded in at least four instances in relation to its enactment. This is not sufficient to remove the statute. Fraud must be proven from the wording of the act itself and the manner in which the words were used. This is the law in relation to statutes. Is the British North American Act fraudulent from the words and the manner in which the words are used? It is. The Federal Union must be free and sovereign, whereas a colony must be subservient. No country could be both at the same time. The words are opposite in their meaning. There is no power in heaven or earth that can pass a law to arbitrarily create a Federal Union. It must be a mutual agreement between those adopting the Constitution. No agreement of any kind has ever been signed between the provinces of Canada. As an enunciation of motives actuating the Parliament to enact the statute, the words federally united into one dominion and the manner in which the, the words are used cons constitutes fraud and brands the British North American Act as a fraudulent measure. It is impossible uh, to be federally united and a dominion at the same time. Search for certified copy of the Act. My research on the subject led me to Ottawa, where, Ottawa, where I examined the documents in the archive. These, the Quebec Resolutions and the Kingdom of Canada draft of the bill, both drafted by our Canadian representatives, are carefully preserved. I 
desired to publicly thank Colonel Hamilton, custodian of the records, for his assistance. At my request to be shown a certified copy of the BNA Act, he regretted that there, there had no such copy in the records, but obliged arranged an appointment with me with M. Lemary Clark of the Privy Cl uh, Council. Not having this document, Mr. Lemaire uh, instructed his secretary to conduct me to the Governor General's office, where I was presented to Mr. Per uh, Peren, now Chief Secretary. Not finding this act, Mr. Perenna handed me a note for Mr. Hardy, parliamentary, uh, parliamentary librarian. At the library, I was informed that this was a very valuable document, and no doubt I would find it in the office of the Secretary of State. Mr. Coleman, the undersecretary, delegated three of his assistants to search the premise. Not being able to find it there, Mr. Coleman directed me to uh, Dr. Beshnausi, uh, uh, Bouchne, uh, clerk of the House of Commons. Why would I have it, said the doctor's reply to my request. No documents are kept here, but you had better see Mr. Blount, clerk of the Senate. He has a vault where important papers are under lock and key. Mr. Blount informed me, however, that he did not know of it, but would open the vault if I would care to look. We descended with an assistant to a room below the Senate chamber, and with the aid of a stepladder, lowered two large cases marked 1867 and 1868. Not finding the certified copy, which I presume the charter of uh, the Dominion government, I suggested that it might be destroyed in a fire which burned the main building in, eight, in 1916. But I was assured that all the documents had been saved. Some had been discolored, discolored by water. All that was lost were some pictures in the gallery. Returning to his office, I inquired if the Senate Journal had any reference to the act being placed before that body. We examined the journal and another large volume which contained the proclamation from Queen Victoria with the names of the first senators, also an exact covering the executive activities of the Senate without success. Was this act ever placed before Parliament, I asked? You will have to ask Dr. Bushney, was the answer. Returning to the Commons, Dr. Bushney made an exhaustive search of his records without finding any reference to the act in his journal. Well, Doctor, I was... I was informed that we had no certified copy of the act in Vancouver by the Chief Justice of British Columbia, but was assured that I would find it in Ottawa. If it were in Canada, it would be no doubt uh, be in Ottawa. So I think have we, uh, we can assume for the purposes of my investigation that no certified copy of the British North America Act was ever brought to Canada. Is that so? I am very much afraid that you are correct, was the doctor's reply. The first, the first page was left out. Why? After the act was passed by the British Parliament, March 29, 1867, printed copies were brought to Canada. These, however, did not contain the first page, which sets forth the enunciations of the motives and the purposes of the enactment. Why was the most important page deleted? This is a vital question that can be best be settled by having a certified copy sent to Canada. The provinces of Canada will then no doubt form a confederation or federal uh, union, words are missing, uh, fourth in the resolution of 1864. No agreement was ever signed by the provinces of Canada or their representatives to confer power to a central government, which is the only way a constitution can be created, first representatives of the provinces are appointed or elected to a constitu uh, constituent assembly where the agreement is drafted. This agreement, after ratification by its electors, is called 
a constitution. Let us examine the difference between a federal union and a colony. The definition of a federal union as given by our law dictionary and the only definition acceptable in a court is a union of sovereign states mutually adopting a constitution. It is not enough uh, that they, are, they be free to unite. They may also be free to reject. This is the meaning of the word mutually. They must also adopt or ratify the agreement by a plebiscite of the people for the people under God are the origins of just power. This was a fundamental provision of a Wittigmont, an early parliament of the Anglo-Saxons. They had the power to dispose their king. This was again enacted by the House of Commons on January 4th, 1649. On January 30th, 1649, Charles I lost his head. That settled the argument. In order that the, car, the court should define words in the same manner, the Interpretation Act was passed in 1889. Section 18, paragraph 3 defines the colony in these words. The expression colony shall mean any of Her Majesty's dominions exclusive uh, of the British Islands and the British India where parts of such dominions are under both a central legislator and local legislators, all part under the central legislator shall, for the purpose of this definition, be deemed to be one colony. As Canada was the only dominion with a central legislature and local legislatures in 1889, it is evident that in a court of law, Canada could not be deemed to be other than a colony. The statute of Westminster in December 11, 1931, had since changed our status. Section 11 says, notwithstanding anything in the Interpretations Act 1889, the expression colony shall not in any act of Parliament or the United Kingdoms pass after the commencement of this act include a dominion or any province or states forming part of a dominion. Canada was a colony before the commencement of this act, never a confederation. It is not generally known that the native sons of Canada, or more particularly Assembly No. 2 of Vancouver, drafted the resolution, which is the basis for the Statue of Westminster, a copy of which is the Parliamentary Library. Governor General without proper authority. The statute gives us a status of equality with Great Britain. They have no more right to issue letter patent to a governor general to govern Canada than Canada has the right to issue letter patents to a governor general to govern Great Britain. In 1867, the Colonial Office drafted a charter which was enacted by the Imperial Parliament in a private bill or statute uniting four of these colonies into one colony without altering the status of their uh, relation to the mother country. Great Britain retained the executive power or legal sovereignty after the Union as before. In other words, they remain colonies of Great Britain with one ge Governor General instead of four and letters patent granting to him the power to govern and a committee of His Majesty's Most Honorable Privy Council. The uh, Minister of Affairs, in connection with the United Colony, as the New England colonies were called dominions, and as Wales was a dominion until the reign of George III, this United Colony was called a dominion. In 1931, the Statue of uh, Westminster, altered this relationship and granted to Canada the right to self-government and in order that the federal union they previously requested could be formed, granted each province the sovereignty to create a federal union. This power was granted to them so that they could create their own government and from the same Commonwealth of Australia, the union of South and words are missing. How was this BNA Act been used? The BNA Act, uh, BNA Act has been used as though it were a constitution of Canada, which is not. 
It has been used to govern Canada. It was the intern, intention of Lord Carnarvon and the colonial office that it should do so. But it was not the idea or intention of the House of Lords or the Commons which enacted it. The Parliament thought uh, it was to be a guide to the creation of a federal union. They knew it, this could only be attained by the agreement between the provinces, so they were not particularly concerned. Uh, give me a moment to find. Ah, here we go. As this as has been shown in the previous section, the provinces were united into one colony, and the colonies can not decide on an agreement, for they are not free to sign anything. That is why, after the act was passed, it was never returned to the provinces for their assent, as the provinces would necessarily have to be free before they could be legally unite or incorporated into a federal union. The statute of Westminster provides a paragraph for this purpose, paragraph two of section seven which is discussed in this section, why the statute of Westminster grants autonomy. Although the objective or redesign of the act is to provide a guide to the creation of the federal union, this scope of the act has not yet been exercised. A legislature of a province may, be, may pass an act to incorporate a locality or district into a municipality, but the actual incorporation must be accomplished by the citizens of the locality. This was the idea of the imperial parliament accepted when they enacted the BNA Act. By the terms of the act of the government general is the government. He received his letter patent uh, to exercise the power of the act from the clerk of the crown in chancery. The, le the latest letters patent were issued to Earl Bessborough and signed by Sir Cloud Schuster May 23, 1931 eight months prior to the enactment of the Statute of Westminster, December 11th, 1931. As Canada has been raised by statute to the accepted constitutional position of equality with Great Britain, the imperial government could not grant further, uh, and this probably is letter patents, uh, in a cable to the imperial uh, authorities in October 1935, I myself protest in any letters patents being issued to Lord Tweedsmere. He received none. Without these all important letters patent, the letters patent, the powers granted to the Governor General in the BNA Act cannot be legally exercised. The statutes of Alberta, there is an act, the Constitutional Questions Determination Act, which provides that any questions touching constitutionality of Alberta or where there is a conflict between the provinces and the Dominion, uh, the case that may be taken to the Supreme Court uh, of any person or classes of persons are entitled to be heard. Sovereign powers is independent in all power from without it is paramount over all actions within. Following is a synopsis of evidence prevent, presented before the special committee convened in 1935 to investigate the, North, the British North American Act, convened at the House of Commons, Ottawa, February 26, 1935, F.W. Turnbull, Chairman. Excerpts from the evidence of Dr. O.D. Skelton, Undersecretary of State of External Affairs, Dr. Oliver Casey, Joint Law Clerk, House of Commons, Dr. W.P. Kennedy, Professor of Law at the University of Toronto, Dr. N. Uh, Mick L. Rogers, professional, uh, professor of political science, Queen's University, Dr. Arthur Beshnu, KC, KMG, LLD, uh, clerk of the House of Commons, Dr. Skelton, undersecretary of the State of External Affairs. Now, it might be said, why not trust to growth of convention or custom, uh, custom altogether for the necessary changes in a constitution? The obvious answer, I think, is that the process is too slow and is applicable only in cases where uh, unanimity, uh, unanimity has been reached. No other country in the world looks to Parliament of another country. 
for the shaping of its constitution. This solution could only be supported if we believe that Canadians are the only people so incompetent that they cannot work out a solution of their own constitutional problem. And so bias that they alone among the peoples of the world cannot be trusted to deal fairly with the various domestic interests concerned. It is not safe to leave the question open and ambiguous indefinitely, for at any time a dispute on a con concrete issue may arise. To retain permanently the intervention of the Parliament of the United Kingdom is either superfluous or dangerous. Dr. Maurice Oliver. Furthermore, our Constitution is a law adopted by the British Parliament exercising its incontestable right of the sovereignty towards its colonies. This explains the fact that the British North America Act is not a reproduction of the Quebec resolutions England was free to agree to the resolutions or to disregard them entirely. Dr. W. P. M. Kennedy, Professor of Law, University of Toronto. I think that we've got to get away from the idea that the British North American Act is a contract or treaty. I do not want to go into that, but it is true neither in historical nor in law. The British North America Act is a statue and has always been interpreted as a statue. Suppose now we assume that it is necessary to have constituent powers in Canada, power to change the Constitution. I approach the problem from two angles. Firstly, of all, I want to break the North American Act up. We have got to ask ourselves, is the dead hand of the past to be constantly laid with numbing effect on the body prolific? That is really what it amounts to. If we in Canada are not capable of interpreting our own constitution, we should not have had a legislature at all. Professor Norman McL. Rogers, Professor of Political Science, Queen's University. I am thoroughly convinced that the British North America Act is not a pact or contract, either in a historical or legal sense, by Mr. Cowan. Question. You get back to this. You start. Your start is another interprovincial conference. Answer. I'm afraid it is. I see no feasible alternatives. Honorable Mr. Laponte, there is no doubt about it. Dr. Bish, uh, Bushnell, KC, CMG, LLD, Clerk of the House of Commons. It is quite true that if we apply to the British North America Act, the principles following in the interpretation of statutes, it is not a compact between provinces. It is an act of Parliament which does not even embody all the resolutions passed in Canada and in London prior to its passage in the British North America and in the British Parliament, where it's certain clauses that had not been recommended by the provincial Canadian provinces were added. The statue of Westminster has altered our status. What we want is a new constitution. The new constitution must leave nobody with a grievance. A spirit of con uh, conciliation should predominate. For these reasons, the task must be entrusted to an independent body in which all elements of the country will be represented. I want the assembly to sit in a city in the West. It would not be necessary for a delegate to be a member of parliament or a provincial legislature. I would suggest that the assembly do not sit in Ottawa in order that it may not have the appearance of being dominated or even influenced by the dominion power as, and, uh, as the western powers are of such paramount importance in the country. I suggest the best city for the uh, representatives to gather in would be Winnipeg. Whether a country should be challenged from a dominion to kingdom is also a subject which might be discussed. I would suggest the country would be called the Federated States of Canada. There have been many disputes about the provincial rights since 1867, and it seems certain that when a new constitution is drawn up and distributed of federal and provincial powers will have to be modified. I submit that appeals to the Privy Council should be dealt with our, uh, by our constitution. This method would preserve the principle of taking our case 
to the highest tribunal without going out of our own country. If you allow me, Mr. Chairman, I will just make another suggestion. If we have a constituent uh, assembly and if we discuss the making of a new constitution, I think it is abnormal that the Dominion Affairs should, to a certain extent, be subject to provincial authority. I would suggest that we have a federal district uh, taking in about 25 square miles on each side of the Ottawa River. I would not have any minority rights discussed. Uh, there is nothing more dangerous in Canada than a discussion of minority rights. A discussion of them would wreck the whole constitute assembly. I think the time is right for a change in the constitution. I do not think that, uh, think you would need much publicity in order to draw to the attention of the people of this country that the British North American Act is inadequate. How did we get the statute of Westminster 1931? Summarizing and consolidating the results of their meeting from 1911, the Imperial Conference of 1926, composed of representatives of all the dominions and of Great Britain, agreed to draft um, words missing presented to Parliament, which would enact a measure to put into effect the, accept, uh, the accepted constitutional position that each of the dominions had equality of status with the United Kingdom. Canada, without question, may be said to have the leading part in these conferences. And in 1926, our Prime Minister, the uh, Right Honorable William uh, Lionel Mackenzie King, moved the first resolution crystallizing the findings of a previous conference and is a synopsis of the accepted opinion and attitudes of the Canadian people towards the Empire and the United Kingdom. It covers all points which are incorporated into the statute of Westminster, particularly that Canada should be elevated constitutionally to a position of equality with the United Kingdom, states the position of Canada in regard to assisted immigration and Canada's natural resources. Our previously expressed attitude on imperial defense and the uh, method of appointing of the Governor General of Canada is ripe for a radical change more in uh, constants with national dignity that the channels of communication between Canada and any other country should be direct. As this resolution was drafted and sent to a Prime Minister by Assembly Number 2 of the Native Sons of Canada, Vancouver, B.C., prior to his departure for the 1926 conference, the last paragraph is, voted, is quoted verbatim. Locarno War, Neutrality, etc. This Assembly is convinced that so long as the present anomalies of Canada's stat status continue, the advantages to Canada from participation in imperial conferences are largely negative. The conference is built on constitutional fiction that all representatives meet as equal. The test, what is Canada constitutionally, is the true test, and until Canada, either by our own act or by imperial concession, attains sovereignty as an independent nation under the crown with international recognition, her position is respect to uh, Britain's avars, neutrality, and her international relationships in general remain clouded and obscured. That position will be and remains both constitutionally and internationally that of colonial status. Mere rhetoric cannot overcome this inescapable fact. The resolution, which was the keynote of the conference, was seconded by Prime Minister Herzog of South Africa. A, con a copy of this resolution with an affidavit signed by the custodian of the records of the Native Sons of Canada, D.H. Elliott, stated that the resolution was presented to the Assembly uh, by Brother R. Roger Smith is in the Parliament Library, Parliamentary Library in Ottawa. The Imperial Conference of 1929, the sections of the Act were condensed into paragraphs to comply with parliamentary practice and procedure in 1930. Prime Minister R.B. Bennett called a conference of the premiers of the uh, words missing of section was added. Why this section included is puzzling. It reads, nothing in this act should be deemed to apply to the repeal, alteration, or amendment of the BNA Act 
1867 to 1930, or any order, rule, or regula- uh, regulation made under 7 as the BNA Act can only be construed as a guide to the creation of a federal union and as this was the enunciation of the motive which prompted the imperial parliament to enact it and as it was will most certainly be scrapped when a federal union is consummated. Why this section 7 paragraph 1 added? It does not alter the meaning of the statute of Met, uh, Westminster one iota. It seems to indicate a lack of knowledge of the British North America Act, which is not surprising as they had no certified copy to consult or examine. Page 14, Section 6, The Statute of Westminster Grats Autonomy. As Dr. Beshen now see, states in his evidence, the the statute of Westminster has altered our status. Section 11 states that after uh, the commencement of the Act, no dominion nor or nor province or state formed forming part of the dominion shall be considered to be a colony. It is acknowledged that the status of Canada before the commencement of the Act was that of a colony, and that it may be said in this uh, connection that until the provinces of Canada had been elevated to a position of autonomy, they had no voice in saying how they should be government. The statute of Westminster altered our status by granting complete autonomy to the provinces. To state that because the provinces of Canada have used the BNA Act for 70 years or because the statute of limitations or for the reason that the Act has been accepted as a cornerstone of Canadian law and legislation that the BNA Act is a constitution is not correct reasoning. First, because the provinces of Canada do not use the BNA Act as a whole, it is an instrument for the exercise of power of the Governor General. It is not accepted by the provinces at any time since its enactment, but has been protested by them on many occasions. We may use the Act as a guide to the creation of a constitution or the basis of an agreement before, between the provinces, as this was the object or intention of the Parliament which enacted it. Or we may dis- disregard it entirely if we choose. Why? Because the provinces of Canada are completely autonomous today. Each province is a political union, a unit without a political superior. Although the statutes affect other dominions as well as Canada, this is to say the Commonwealth of Australia, the Commonwealth, the Union of South Africa, New Zealand, the Irish Free State, and Newfoundland, it also extends autonomy to each individual province of Canada. Paragraph 2 of Section 7 states that the provisions of Section 2 of this Act shall extend to laws made by any of the provinces of Canada and to the powers of legislatures of such provinces. The provisions of Section 2 are those which grant autonomy. Autonomy is not divisible. Either you have it or you have not. Why these autonomous powers are not granted to the states of Australia individually or the states of South Africa? Because these states had created their constitutions before the commencement of this uh, statute of Westminster. Granting autonomy to Canada as a whole was not sufficient. In the opinion of the Imperial Parliament, which enacted the statute, for they knew it would be necessary for the provinces to grant their power to a central government, and this could only be done if they were free. This is further discussed in the section, The Federated States of Canada. Page 15. Although Canada, and more particularly, uh, peculiarly, British Columbia took the lead in placing before Imperial Conference the reasons for the enactment of the Statue of Westminster. Can uh, Ada has not taken advantage of its provisions. The other dominions affected have taken advantage of this measure and although remain within the empire, have their own constitutions. The Irish Free State has no governor general. The Premier now acts as the representative of His Majesty. Uh, South Africa is no longer tied to the apron strings of Grandma Herzog. A parliament of a dominion is not a central legislature of a colony, and no alteration of its charter can make it so. Sections 3 and 4 of the Statute of Westminster do not refer to the central legislature at Ottawa. This can only be 
construed as it states as a parliament uh, representing the provinces of Canada must be one whose charter is granted by an agreement between the provinces or in other words is created by them. Number uh, part seven, next steps, the Federated States of Canada. It is true that the Federated States of Canada would not be dependent in any way on an imperial parliament for their government. Why should Canada be dependent? Are the states of Australia, South Africa, or the English Free State less a part of the empire because they constructed constitutions that are free to govern themselves? The story of constitution, uh, confederation is a myth. And those that think that Sir John A. Macdonald was the father of Confederation know little about this question. In a letter to Lord Knutsford, Secretary of State for the Colonies, at the time of the first meetings were held between the states of Australia regarding a federal union in 1888, Sir John expressed his regret for the defeat of the 1867 in the following words. If the statute, the BNA Act, had only followed the Canadian draft of the bill, Australia air this would have a government similar to the Kingdom of Canada. Before this, and because Sir John uh, knew the inside story of the perennial page missing and the hair-trigger relationship between uh, Great Britain and the United States of America, he reluctantly accepted appointment as one of the British representatives in the negotiations to agree on the terms of the Treaty of Washington. And from beginning to end, the negotiations he found it necessary to fight against the sacrifice of Canadian rights. This is clearly seen in the following extract from a letter he wrote at the time to Dr. Tupper. I must say that I'm greatly disappointed at the course taken by the British commissioners. They seem, they seem to have only one thing on their minds, and that is to go home with a treaty in their pockets, settling ever, uh, everything, no matter at what cost, to Canada. The fact, uh, the effect at which must be produced on the mind in Canada by a declaration. Page 16. Uh, okay, continuation. So let's reread that. The effects which must be produced on the public mind in Canada by de declaration by both parties in the uh, Imperial Parliament against, of course, which greatly prejudice the idea of British connection, as British connection will have proved itself a farce. I do not like to look at the consequence, but we are so clearly in the right that we must throw the responsibility on England. Is the father of confederation speaking? If no ulterior motive was served, why do the stories of confederation circulate? All that can be said is that the gullibility of Canadians was just deplorable. No member of the Dominion government today would seriously contend that he knows anything about the British North America Act, for they know there is no certified uh, copy in Canada, and anything less than an examination of a certified copy can only be classed as an assumption. There is a vast difference between assumptions, belief, and the ability to produce factual evidence. The next step is an interprovincial conference where an agreement can be reached upon the powers to be conferred on the central government and the powers which must be retained by the provinces. Uh, federation. First of all, uh, powers must be conferred upon the appointed representatives of the provinces so as to carry the government of Canada and with the power to call an election as soon as the responsibilities after confederation, uh, constitution has been ratified by the people of each of the provinces. And then some unlegible words. On the opposite page is set forth the exact wording of the first page of the BNA Act containing the preamble of the Act, which has not been published in the official copies of the Act of the statutes, either in Great Britain or in Canada. Uh, and then uh, 1867, 1867, the British North America Act, enacted by Her Most Gracious Majesty Queen Victoria and the Imperial Parliament by reason of the request of the colonies for federal government. It is expedient, therefore, that we have laws to re and regulations to guide them. And that is the end of this document. Thank you for watching. Check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Helia Canada. Thank you. Mm -hmm.